Hello everyone, this is Doug, and in this lesson I'm going to introduce you to the kinetic theory of matter and how it relates to the states of matter and what particles look like, what things look like on an atomic level. So the kinetic theory of matter um, has just a couple of different postulates to it. One, it basically states that all matter that you see, everything that you, you, you know, if you look around and you take a look at it, that it's all composed of particles, right? And by particles I just mean molecules or atoms or ions, some little tiny piece, some very, very small thing. So everything around you is made out of these massive amounts of tiny little pieces. And these tiny little pieces are in constant motion. Aside from absolute zero, they're constantly moving. So either they're like gases that are, those particles are whirring around the air right now. They're just flying around you right now, bouncing into you. Um, versus if it's something like a solid, even though the table in front of me looks very solid, the idea is that those little um, either metal particles or the, the molecules in the, in the uh, plastics, they're actually vibrating slightly. They, we can't see them, but they're actually vibrating at that, at that atomic level. So they're actually moving, regardless of how it doesn't seem like the table's flying across the room. It's actually vibrating at a very, very uh, um, microscopic atomic level. And then lastly is that the speed at which a particle moves is directly proportional to that temperature, right? So um, you may have seen in physics these sorts of equations here, right, where um, this is Ke, kinetic energy, which is that energy of motion. And V is velocity, uh, which is sort of like a speed and direction. So you may have learned that kinetic energy is one half mv squared. Um, that relates the amount of kinetic energy to the velocity of something. And if we kind of get rid of all those um, constants, the one half m, right, so the, the, the mass of whatever that particle is, you'll see that the temperature, so T for temperature, uh, temperature is proportional to the speed of the, of the molecule, of the, of the particle, speed of particle. And while not all temperature technically is average kinetic motion, but mostly when people talk about the temperature of something, if you take the temperature of, um, you know, a, a piece of meat you're cooking, the air outside, whatever, you're measuring the average kinetic energy of those particles around you. That's what you measure when you measure temperature. And so I want to take a little, a little closer look at, at what does matter look like on this atomic level, and what what do we talk, what are we talking about when we say that like the temperature and the speed of a particle are directly proportional, right? So what we're saying here is that as you increase the temperature, you should also be increasing the speed of the particle. So let's take a look at that. So this is a great website from um, FET. It's a, a bunch of simulations from the University of Colorado. And in this one, I just want to show you, you know, what some of these phases look like. So let's take a look at oxygen here. Um, so we've got a bunch of oxygen molecules. Remember, oxygen is a diatomic element. It's O2. So you see two red spheres here. They're sort of uh, two overlapping spheres. And the idea here is that we're currently looking at the solid phase. And we know it's a solid phase because it's really orderly. Those particles are not slipping over one another. They are vibrating slightly, right? Like I was just saying before, that... Um, all of these particles have some motion, assuming that we're not at, at zero Kelvin, at absolute zero. So they all have some motion, but they don't have free motion. Versus if I go and I look at the liquid, you can see, right, that these O2 molecules are still attracted to one another, and they're kind of slipping and sliding over each other, but they, are, they haven't separated fully. And they differ from that solid phase because there's not that organization that we saw. And then if you go to a liquid phase, right, you can see that, or sorry, the gas phase, you can see that all of these particles are totally separate from one another. They're off doing their own thing, they're not sticking together, and they're basically filling up the whole container. They're gases, they're, they're not uh, interacting much with each other at all. And what I was saying about that kinetic theory of matter, right, is that, so if I take a look at these, right, I'm back at my solid, I can add some heat, I can cool it down with this little gauge here. Um, this link is posted on your website, so you guys can go play with this later if you want. But if I add heat and I start raising the temperature, you can see that those molecules start to move faster and faster. And if I keep on adding heat, then I take that solid and I've just melted it, right? So now it doesn't have quite that same structure, that, that repeating crystalline, highly ordered structure anymore. And it's starting to move around and slip over each other, so I know I have a liquid. If I keep on adding heat, those particles are going to vibrate faster and faster until I boil the things. We undergo that phase change, so now it's boiling, and those particles are turning into gas, uh, the gas phase, right, the, that state of matter. So now they're all moving independently for the most part. They're going to stop sticking uh, to one another and take up that whole, that whole volume. And I could do the opposite, right? I could cool it down instead, and you should see the motion of the particles start to slow down. And as they start to slow down, they'll be able to stick together better. So we're already starting to see some starting to stick. 
And as they start to stick together, they'll form a liquid phase. I won't sit here and do this forever. I don't want to waste your time. But you can see already that there are clumps forming, right? That some are starting to stick together. And if we kept on waiting, we kept on lowering the temperature, we'd see that more and more would clump together until eventually they finally started to all coalesce and all formed a solid form. So you can see already they're starting to form solids as they all stick together, right? They're not slipping around anymore. And you can see that they're not really vibrating at all because I'm, I'm only at two Kelvin, only two, uh, two Kelvin above absolute zero. Let's take a look at something we're a little more familiar with, good old water, good old oxygen. If I pause this for a second, you can take a look. I know it's kind of small here, but right, we have water, H2O. So on this diagram, it looks like those white spheres are hydrogen atoms, right? Two hydrogen atoms for every one oxygen atom, H2O. And that that red sphere is the oxygen in the middle. So we got the red oxygen in the middle, the two hydrogens on either side. And if I take a look at my ice, so here's my solid... Here's my solid water. Notice it's vibrating, but those actual molecules are not moving around freely over one another very much. So we're still in a solid phase here. If I start to heat it up, we're going to see, right, that it's going to vibrate faster and we'll actually see it turn into a liquid. So here we go. It's heating, it's heating, it's heating. Whoop! Just turn into a liquid. So now you can see that those particles are moving more. You can see that they're kind of flipping around. Uh, there's a lot more motion in the liquid phase. And if I keep on heating it, right, again, I'll take that water, that liquid water, and I'll boil it to turn it into um, uh, steam, right, basically get the gas water. And now you can see particles are freeing themselves from that liquid and evaporating. As I keep on going up and up, right, we'll see that all of those water molecules now behave independently. They're going to stop clumping together, and all behave as just free gases filling up that entire form. And so we've got the gas freely floating right, water molecules. They're not really attracted to each other. They take up all that space. We have the liquid where they are much closer together, but they have some motion and they can move around. You can see them kind of bouncing around and slipping and sliding past each other. Uh, they're close together and they do have some attraction, but not as much as with the solids, right? So the solids are really tightly held together. Um, and this example is kind of cool because you can see how um, the solid water is actually less dense than liquid water. See how there's all these holes, there's all these pores here. Um, so solid water is one of those substances. It's, it, it, it's not typical. For the most part, most solids are more dense than their liquid phase, but water is one where it's opposite. And you can see that when I heat this up again, you can see it sort of become more dense, whoosh, just like that. It became more dense. There's, le there's fewer spaces in between those molecules uh, as it heated up. So while well, generally speaking, you go from the most dense being the solid, the next dense being the liquid, and the least dense being the gas, water is one of those exceptions. If I did it with argon, for example, if I had the solid phase, right, there's like no gaps between those particles. And if you go to the liquid phase, boom, there's a whole bunch more gaps between them, right? You pause at any moment and there's more space between them, making it take up more volume and therefore they're less dense. So you can play with this, but I just want you to kind of visually see the differences between a solid, a liquid, and a gas and how they behave at that atomic level. So I've got a chart I want to take a look at in the next slide here. So we're going to fill that out. And again, I've posted this on your web page. So take a look. So let's take a look at this, right? Let's try to translate what we just saw there. So I've solid liquid gases. I have some different properties, like their density and their vibrational speeds. Um, if I take a look at this here, right? So for my solids, the vibrational speed, if you remember, the solid was very, very slow. It had a very, very slow speed. It vibrated very little. The liquid was sort of the intermediate, so sort of a, uh, so I'll put intermediate, just intermediate. And then the gas was the fastest. All right, it was the fastest. Those were the ones that were flying around the most. They had the most energy. As far as the density, right, remember that density is just how many grams per milliliter or kilograms per liter. That's just how much stuff is in a little volume. And since the solids were the, had the smallest volume, right, all those particles were in one spot, that had the highest density. So we have the highest density going to the uh, lowest density. So gases were much less dense, right? They filled that whole container. So a lot, a lot less dense, right? It's much easier for us to walk through air than it is to walk through a wall. <laughs> Uh, shape. Does the shape of that matter depend on the container? So for a solid, does the shape of a solid thing depend on the container you put it in? And the answer for that, right, as we know, is no. 
So if I take the, my pen that I'm holding and I put it in a round container or I put it in a square container, it doesn't change its shape, right? It's still gonna be pen shaped. If I take my wedding ring and put it on the table versus put it in a, in a glass, it doesn't change the shape. So it's, its shape does not depend on the container. So any solid thing. However, for liquids, right, they do change. So if you take water, right, and you have a, a, a round glass and you pour it into sort of a squarish glass, you pour it onto the table and it falls off, right, that's going to change the shape of that water. The, the water shape is going to change depending on what container it's in. It just, it flows to fill the, its container. And then ditto gases. We don't really see them, so it's kind of hard for us to imagine, but if you had a star-shaped container, uh, your gas would be in a star shaped, would, would occupy a star shaped uh, volume. Ditto a square, ditto round, ditto like a balloon or something like that, right? Ditto a gas tank, like an air tank. Um, the gas will just fill that whole container, like you saw again on that simulator, it just fill that whole container. And then does the volume depend on the container? Again, again, um, no for solids, right? Because again, it's not like my pen or my ring is going to become larger or smaller, occupy more or less space, depending on the container I put it in. That's That, that, that doesn't happen. Uh, but liquids, does the volume of a liquid depend on the container? And I often get students to be like, well, yeah, because it maybe changes the shape too. But if you think about it, right, if you take one gallon of milk, you can't take that one gallon of milk and put it in any size container you want, right? Because a gallon is a gallon. Uh, my kids have tried to put one gallon of milk in their one little glass. It doesn't work. It overflows, right? We know that just because you have a different size container doesn't mean that the volume changes, right? So if you have a cup of milk, a gallon of milk, it's always that volume no matter how, no matter the size of the container you put it in, right? If you take that gallon of milk and you pour it in an empty swimming pool, it doesn't suddenly become thousands of gallons of milk. It's still just one gallon of milk in the bottom of a big old pool. So no, the volume does not change for a liquid. However, for gases, it does. Because again, a gas will just fill the whole volume and the shape of, a, of whatever container it's in. Um, so the, the volume of a gas does depend on the container it's in. The example I always use with my students is that, right, um, I don't know if anyone's ever played with those little stink bombs. They come in like little like containers. They're in like a little, a little container, like just a, a few milliliters. Uh, you can hold it in the palm of your hand. So all of that stinky, smelly gas is in that little container in your hand. And if you smash it right in the middle of a room, that volume of that gas is going to expand greatly to fill the room and make the whole room stinky, make the whole room smell terrible, right? So that would be an example of a gas going from a little volume because of its container to a huge volume because of its container. There's also experiments you can do at home. You've probably done this before. You, you know, you can take a balloon and you can squish it slightly. You can slightly change the volume um, of that balloon because you can compress it. So if you change the volume of that balloon, you can change the volume of the gas inside of it, um, et cetera. And then last, I'm going to do this in a different color because it's, it's going to be really important for us, is what about the amount of attraction between particles? Like, did these particles seem sticky? Were they attracted to one another, right? This is going to be really, really important for us. Were they, did they stick to one another? And if you remember that the gases, I'll start with the gases here, the gases just were flying around all by themselves. They had no attraction to each other whatsoever. They weren't sticking at all. They bounced off of each other, but they didn't really clump up, right? They just filled that volume. They were not sticky. So for gases, with gases, you basically say that there's no attraction. No attraction between particles whatsoever. If you go to, you know what, I don't like that, that green, sorry, just kidding. So we are going to, uh, we'll stick with blue. So we said for the gas, no attraction. For liquids though, they were not totally free. They did stick to one another, right? They flowed over each other. Particles moved past each other, but they still stuck together. And if you have trouble remembering that, by all means, go backwards in the video a little bit and take a look at what that liquid water or liquid O2 looked like. They'll flow over each other, but they were still clumped together. So there was still some attraction. There was some attraction. There was, uh, there was some attraction between those particles. And then again, if you remember back with the solids, right, there was a lot of attraction. They were pretty rigid. The pieces were held in, in place. So there was a lot of attractive forces between those particles. So there was lots of attraction between particles uh, for solids. 
right? There was a lot of attraction there. And so solids had the most attraction, liquids had some attraction, but gases had no attraction whatsoever. So what we need to figure out now, what this next video is on, is sort of the next thing you want to be asked, the next question you want to ask yourself is, what is the nature of this attraction, right? What is this? What is the thing that's causing this attraction here? What is going on? Um, and that's why we need to talk about attractive forces, also sometimes called intermolecular forces. So hopefully in this video, right, you have a little bit of a, a better sense of the difference between solids, liquids, and gases, what the kinetic theory of matter is. And our next move now is to start talking about these attractions. What is an ion-ion attractive force, a hydrogen bond, a dipole-dipole attractive force, etc.? So look forward to that video. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. Happy studying.